in every moment of noticing, in every moment of being mindful, when there is no ignorance, when there is no delusion, when we are seeing things actually as they are, in that moment the mind is purified. We are breaking this chain of dependent origination. We are breaking the link of it. Welcome to the Joseph Goldstein Insight Hour. This podcast is an expression of our shared interest in self-discovery. Join Joseph as he shares his deep knowledge of the path of mindfulness. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Joseph. You may have noticed in the library the Tibetan painting of the Wheel of Life, the Wheel of Samsara. The meaning of the word Samsara is perpetual wandering. In that painting, it depicts the cycles of existence of perpetual wandering through all the realms. We keep looking for a sense of completion or fulfillment, security or happiness. Not understanding the insubstantial nature, the continually changing nature of this cycle of existence. But what we are is a process of continual change, arising and dissolving, arising and vanishing. In the human realm, is said to be one of the happy realms of existence. This wheel of samsara, this wheel of perpetual wandering, unfolds through different realms, some of great happiness, some of great suffering. And what's said to be of most consequence, or most greatest importance, in this cycle of samsara is the phenomena of birth and decay and death which characterizes all of the realms of existence from the lowest to the highest all are characterized by birth, decay and death. And it's said that Buddhas arise in the world for the express purpose of penetrating or understanding the root causes of these phenomena. What is the cause? What are the conditions for this cycle of birth, decay, death, rebirth, decay, death? What is the root cause of the wandering through samsara? On the night of the Buddha's enlightenment, he penetrated into the law of conditioning, the law of causality, which described the process by which we stay entangled or enmeshed or driven through the cycle of rebirth. This is not a theoretical or abstract understanding or teaching. It has an immensely profound relevance, 
not only for the Buddha, but for ourselves. What keeps us wandering endlessly? It's said that listening to the Dharma is actually a component of meditative practice. Because when we listen attentively, and when we listen in a way that connects the words to our experience, it actually has the power to liberate. Tonight's talk will be a good test of your ability or willingness to listen attentively. So I'd like to talk about this law of dependent origination, this law of causality, of conditioning, so we can understand the process by which we stay bound to this wheel of life, this wheel of samsara. The Buddha once admonished Ananda, who was his attendant, for exclaiming that this law of dependent origination, this profound and deep law, was plain and simple to understand. On one level it's plain and simple, and yet its meaning is exceedingly deep and profound. So see if you can stay with the various links in this chain. The Buddha was faced with the problem of understanding birth, decay, and death. That's where he started. So he worked his way backwards. Given the fact of death, of decay and death, what conditions that? What is the cause of decay and death? He saw that the cause of decay and death was birth. That if we take birth, old age, disease, and death are inevitable. It's an inevitable consequence of taking birth. What is the cause of birth? What is the condition for birth? He looked and he saw that karmic actions, volitional activities, are the cause of taking birth. What are the cause, what's behind these volitional activities? Where do they arise from? They arise from grasping in the mind or clinging in the mind. Because we grasp or cling, that leads us to perform various actions, the karmic consequence of which is birth, the result of birth being decay and death. Why do we grasp? Why do we cling? Why are we attached? Because of desire in the mind. Why is there desire in the mind? Why is there that craving in the mind? Because there are feelings. Again, feeling in the Buddhist sense of pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. We crave for pleasant feeling. That desire leads to grasping. That grasping leads to action. That action leads to rebirth. Leads to decay. Leads to death. Why are there feelings? Feelings arise out of contact. Contact with the sense objects. Where does contact arise from? It arises because we have the sense organs, the sense bases. If we didn't have the sense bases, there could not be contact. Where do the sense bases come from? They come from having a mind and body. We didn't have a mind and body, there would be no sense bases, there would be no contact, there would be no feeling, there would be no desire, there would be no grasping, no karmic actions, no birth, no decay, no death. 
Why do we have a mind and body? Because of rebirth consciousness. Because we took birth. Mind and body, sense bases, contact, feeling, and so forth. What conditions that rebirth consciousness? Volitional activities in the past life. Because we performed all kinds of actions. There was a karmic energy involved which led to rebirth. What conditioned those karmic actions? Ignorance. When he traced it all the way back from the present fact of death, traced back all of these links, he saw that the root, the root cause, the basic condition for that whole chain unfolding is the fact of ignorance. In case you missed all the links going backwards, what I'd like to do now is to go forwards, going through them one by one to see how the one leads into the other. And again, it's important to listen to this, to understand it not as an abstract theory, which may be interesting or not, depending on your inclination, but as a way of understanding the driving force, the conditioning force in our lives, which keeps us going round and around and around. It really pertains very exactly and deeply to the question of bondage and the question of freedom. So what is ignorance? There are two kinds of ignorance. There's the ignorance of non-practice and the ignorance of delusion. Two aspects of this factor. The ignorance of non-practice means that when we are not mindful, when we are not practicing awareness, mindfulness, attentiveness, then we are unable to see or to understand that everything is in a process of continual change. That what we are is this process of consciousness and object, knowing an object, arising and vanishing 17 trillion times a moment. Nothing substantial, not referring back to anybody. That what we are is this process of constant dissolution. When we're not mindful, we don't see that. And so ignorance then gives rise to the illusion of woman or man or person or being or body or arm or leg. It gives rise to concept, the concept of self. When we don't see the momentariness of phenomena, then we're unable to understand the first noble truth, which Michelle spoke of the other night. We're unable to appreciate, to understand, to see that there is dukkha, there is suffering inherent in this process of momentariness, of continual dissolution. There is no security. There is nothing to hold on to. There is no satisfaction because everything is continually dissolving. This ignorance of the first noble truth leads to the second kind of ignorance, which is kind of delusion. Delusion in this sense means that 
not only don't we see that everything is continually changing, which gives rise to the concept of being, of person, of self, of I, the delusion that arises is that we actually take what is suffering, take what is unsatisfactory to be desirable. We live in that delusion that what is actually insecure, unsatisfactory, suffering, we take to be good and valuable and desirable. Basic delusion. For example, generally we take what are called the five strands of sense pleasures to be good and desirable. Pleasant sights and sounds and smells and tastes and nice sensations in the body. We spend a tremendous amount of energy seeking our happiness in the acquiring or gaining or holding on to these these five sense pleasures. We value them. We think that they're important. Because we don't see, we don't understand their deficiencies, their lack, their basic unsatisfactoriness. Because of this, because of this ignorance of not seeing and because of the delusion of actually taking them to be valuable, which is just the opposite of how things actually are, this ignorance conditions the next step in this law of dependent origination. This ignorance then conditions activities, activities of our body, of our speech, of our mind in an effort to acquire different kinds of sense pleasure, we perform various actions. Sometimes the actions are wholesome, sometimes they're unwholesome. But it's our desire for happiness, in this case conditioned by ignorance, wrongly placed, that leads us to perform all the different kinds of volitional activities. And this is very important and something we often are not aware of, that volition, every volitional action contains the seed of rebirth. Volition is an extremely potent factor of mind. It's like an apple seed, which contains potentially, it has the potential for creating an apple. The seed has the potential of the fruit within it. Volitional action has the potential for bearing the fruit of its particular karma. So because of our ignorance, because of taking what is undesirable to be desirable, what we value, we perform all of these actions, then these actions become the conditioning force for rebirth. Because they contain within themselves, they contain within that moment of volition, the seed of future birth. Ignorance conditions actions, actions condition rebirth. Rebirth conditions mind and body because of that rebirth consciousness. There's the development of the mind and body from the moment of conception. And this mind and body develops and grows. Because of the mind and body conditions the sense bases. That is the eye and the ear and the nose and the tongue and the body and the mind. These sense bases are worth investigating. They're worth considering. 
They're not simply apertures. They're not just holes in the body. There's another quality to these sense bases which characterizes them, and that is they are the sensitive media for receiving the appropriate class of of objects, of sense objects. The eye is the sensitive media for receiving light, the ear for sound. And each one, obviously, is sensitive to its own particular class of objects. The tongue doesn't see, and the ear doesn't smell. Because of rebirth consciousness, there's the mind and body. Because of the mind and body, these six sense bases arise. Because of the six sense bases, there is contact. Without them, without the eye and ear and nose and tongue and body and mind, there would be no contact possible. And contact means the stimulation of the sense base which is a sensitivity. Contact is the stimulation of that sensitivity by a particular object. So there's a sound, and the ear, and the consciousness arising from that impingement, that conjunction is called contact. The object, the sense object, the sense base, and the consciousness arising from it. That's contact. Because of the sense base, contact arises. Because of contact, feeling arises. These feelings of pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral play a very critical role in this chain of dependent origination. Because up until this point, we're experiencing the results of our past karma. It's because of past volitional activity that there was rebirth consciousness and mind-body and six sense bases and contact and feeling. There's nothing we can do about that. That's all resultants. But it's just at this place, in this law of conditioning, conditionality, that there's a possibility for breaking the chain of conditioning. Because of contact, this feeling, in every moment of contact, it's inevitable, a feeling will be associated with it. Every sight, every sound, every thought, every sensation, every taste, every smell, it's either pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. That feeling comes automatically. When we are not mindful, when we are not attentive and aware, then the feeling conditions desire, conditions craving. What is this factor of craving? Craving is a hungering or a thirsting for pleasant experience. We hunger after these pleasant feelings. The problem with this factor of craving, of hungering, of thirsting, is that it is incapable of being satiated. Precisely because the feelings are always changing. Somewhat comparable to our experience of hunger for food. We're hungry, we eat, we feel full. 
and a few hours later we're hungry again. And we eat, and we feel full. A few hours later, the next day, again the hunger is there, because the food does not last permanently. It's not a it's not able to provide that sense of satiation. So it's exactly in the same way that when we don't understand the nature of the mind and the nature of our desires, we keep looking to fulfill our craving for pleasant feelings with something that is incapable of bringing us to a place of completion. There is no end to it. Because of feelings we desire, we have this thirst, we have this hunger. This desire then conditions grasping or clinging, which is just a more intense form of the craving. Craving is like reaching for something, and grasping or clinging is like grabbing it, holding on to it. Because of this clinging or grasping or attachment, we perform all kinds of actions again in order to fulfill our wanting. Some of the actions are wholesome, some are unwholesome. These actions, these volitional activities, we do it in four ways. Again, it's important to understand it because this link of volition, volitional activity based this time on grasping, will be the cause of future birth. So we have to understand the ways in which this karma is created. It's created through our own actions. It's created by instigating others to act. There's a karmic force when we encourage somebody else to act, either in a wholesome way or an unwholesome way. There's a karmic force when we are instigated to act by somebody else, when it's not coming from us, but we're responding to somebody else's encouragement. And there's a karmic force even when we commend an action. There's a force involved there because of the intention. So when somebody does something that's either skillful or unskillful, and we commend it, We are creating that volition which can result in rebirth. Because of feelings there's desire, because of desire there's grasping. Because of grasping we perform all kinds of actions. Because of those volitions, in those actions we create the seeds of rebirth because of rebirth, there's again decay and death. And so we go around in this cycle. There are some interlocking cycles in this law of dependent origination. When we understand the interlocking cycles, begin to see, you know the, the image of the Mobius strip, you know, the strip of paper that's twisted and then pasted together so it's a, it's a perpetual, no beginning and no end. <laughs> that's this law of dependent origination. The cycles involved in it, the cycles which keep us wandering perpetually, start with the cycle of defilement. 
These are the links of ignorance, of craving, and of grasping. Of the twelve links in the law of dependent origination, three of these links are involved in the cycle of defilement. Ignorance, craving, and grasping. Because of these defilements arises the cycle of action. Those volitional activities which are based either on ignorance or on craving. So the cycle of defilements leads to the cycle of action. The cycle of action leads to the cycle of result. If there's a karmic action, it is inevitable that a result will follow. The result being rebirth consciousness, mind, body, sense bases, contact, feeling. The cycle of defilement, ignorance, craving, and grasping produces action. The cycle of action produces the cycle of result, the result being this, the fact that we're sitting here. Because of the cycle of results, because we have a body and sense bases and contact and feeling, new defilements arise. Because feelings condition craving. The results condition the cycle of defilements. The defilements condition action. The actions condition results. The results condition defilements. Do you understand that painting in the library? We are going around and around in these three cycles. Cycles of kilesa, defilement, cycle of action, leading to cycle of results, leading to new cycle of defilement. What to do? Is there a way out of this? The greatness of the Buddha's enlightenment was not only his able to see so clearly this chain of conditions, this chain of causality, which keeps us bound in these three cycles, he was also able to see how it's possible to free ourselves from it. In every moment of noting, in every moment of being mindful, mindful of the breath, of the rising and falling, of a sensation, of a thought, of a sound, of a sight, in every moment of noticing, there is no ignorance. Because we are seeing the true nature of experience. We are seeing the true characteristics of experience. What are they? When we are mindful, we see that everything is changing, that everything is arising and passing away. Because of that, out of that insight into impermanence, we see and understand on ever-deepening levels the basic unsatisfactoriness of it. And again, this does not stay on a conceptual or an abstract level, through our practice, through the mindfulness in each moment through which we eliminate ignorance, we begin to intuitively understand the impermanence, the unsatisfactory, the selflessness. That phenomenon does not belong to anybody. When this ignorance is not present, then we are not led to desire or grasp or become attached to this phenomena, the phenomena of the six objects. I'll give you an example of how this works. A couple of years ago, I bought a very beautiful little carpet, which is upstairs in my room now, for those of you who come for groups. 
nice, I think it's a Pakistani or a Kashmiri carpet. Very beautiful, I thought. And one time I was doing, I was on retreat and I was, I was using it as a meditation carpet. And I was just looking at it and admiring it so much. I loved the carpet. And the more I looked at it, the more I liked it. It seemed to me the perfect carpet. (laughs) And one day, I was looking at this perfect carpet, which I was very attached to. How often does one find a perfect carpet? (laughs) I was looking at it very carefully and admiringly, and I saw that in one part of the carpet, just one part of the design, the weaver must have been drunk. (laughs) Because it's all very symmetrical, except in this one little corner, which at first I didn't notice, but the pattern was completely askew. And I was, I didn't know what he was up to, or she. In that moment of seeing this imperfection of the carpet, it's like all the attachment to it disappeared. I started thinking, well, who can I give it away to him? <laughs> you know. It's not so nice though giving away something that's flawed like that. (laughs) And this thing which I valued so much in one instant of seeing its flaw, its fault, like all the attachment to it fell away. It was no longer so desirable, no longer so valuable to me. This, us, this mind and body, when we don't look carefully, we become so attached to it because we don't understand the basic deficiency of the process, the false inherent in it. And that's not to say, sometimes people mis- misinterpret this and think that we should have this attitude of you know, oh, this is so bad and condemning and judging and torturing it. and It's none of that. But rather through seeing its true nature, through seeing that the idea of man or woman or person or body or arm or leg or hand, that all of that, you know, the perfect arm, the perfect body, all of that is concept that what is actually happening, when we can see it clearly and directly in our experience, is simply a process of phenomena arising and vanishing every instant, we begin to lose our fascination for it. Because in the moment of seeing this arising and passing away of phenomena, there's no greed, there's no attachment, there's no clinging, there's no ignorance. We're seeing things truly. The aim of Vipassana is to cut the cycle of defilement. That's the purpose of Vipassana practice. Because if the cycle of defilement is there, from the defilements come actions, from the actions come results, from the results come new defilements. So as long as that cycle of defilement is there, of ignorance, craving, and grasping, we are caught on this wheel of samsara. And the purpose of Vipassana is to cut that cycle of defilement. Because when there's no cycle of defilement, then there's no cycle of action, no cycle of result. In every moment of noticing, in every moment of being mindful, when there is no ignorance, when there is no delusion, when we are seeing things actually as they are, in that moment the mind is purified. We are breaking this chain 
of dependent origination. We are breaking the link of it. And so instead of contact, conditioning feeling, conditioning desire, contact conditions feeling, which we can't help. We have that as a result. Contact conditions feeling, conditions wisdom. If we can be mindful in each moment, aware of the object, aware of the feeling, is it pleasant, is it unpleasant, is it neutral, and we're aware of that, the awareness prevents the arising of desire. Without desire, there's no grasping. Without grasping, there's no karmic activity. There's no result in rebirth. And so, as a reminder to you, that although at times what we are doing may seem very ordinary or very mundane or very boring even. The power of each moment of mindfulness is enormous in its potential to cut this chain of causality. And that is the place for us of realizing freedom. Freedom from samsara. Freedom from this cycle of perpetual wandering. Do you have any questions? (laughs) The role of aversion? Aversion and greed are basically two sides of the same coin. We have greed or desire for pleasant feelings when we're not mindful. We have aversion or anger or irritation or annoyance, all those forms of aversion, for unpleasant feeling. But in every moment of aversion, the, the other side of that aversion for what is unpleasant is greed for what is pleasant. I couldn't give you a real exact answer about that because I'm not that familiar with kind of the uh, that level of Abhidhamma distinctions. But what comes to my mind is um, that somehow probably what's related in your question is what Sharon talked about, about different personality types. You know, and so for some people, the greed factor will be the predominant mode of perceiving the world. And for other people, aversion will be the predominant mode of perceiving the world. And for other people, delusion will be. So my sense is that that's somehow connected you know, to, to what you're asking. But the, the conditioning is the same. In other words, feeling conditions either the Uh, grasping for what's pleasant, the craving for what's pleasant, or the aversion, which is really a craving to be rid of. So in both ways, there's a kind of craving which then leads to uh, grasping at certain actions, either to hold on or to push away, depending whether it's pleasant or unpleasant. When the equanimity is strong, and it's one of the factors which develops in the practice, we begin to develop a much greater capacity for impartiality towards pleasant and unpleasant. And that's a tremendous strength and freedom of the mind when we're not buffeted by the reactions to these changing feelings. Because the feelings will be there. There's no way to prevent them. Every moment of contact is going to give us a feeling. Sometimes they'll be pleasant, sometimes unpleasant. When the equanimity is strong, the mind stays very stable, stays very open, very accepting. There's one very 
beautiful line from teachings of the third Zen patriarch. He said, the great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. When attachment and aversion are both absent, the way is clear and undisguised. But you see how difficult it is to have that level equanimity because our minds are so conditioned by this law of dependent origination because of feeling we're conditioned to to crave, to desire, either to hold on or to push away. So it's exactly at that point that the mindfulness steps in. It's right at that point that we cut the chain. Isn't there a cause for ignorance? Is, is it a cycle in the sense that in death and decay then condition ignorance? The Buddha talked of how ignorance and desire sort of revolve about one another as the conditioning causes of each other. Because the mind is filled with desire, it doesn't see things clearly. And it doesn't see things clearly because of the ignorance. And because of the ignorance, the desire is there. And so it just loops around. Why is it that with one certain object, different people see it with a different feeling. The feelings that we experience are the karmic results of past actions. They arise because of the contact. If there was no contact, the feeling wouldn't be there. But what the feeling is is a result of our past action. And so some person might experience it as pleasant because of a past wholesome action. Somebody else may experience it as unpleasant because of a past unwholesome action. Uh, why is it that at different times one, one person would see the same object in different ways? Also the same reason. Because, because each time that we experience a feeling, it is the karmic result of some previous action. Comment, I'm struck by um, how in this um, perspective the way of liberation seems dependent on learning to value less what is given rather uh, than um, learning to value more. To value, I would say, different things. It's learning to value. <clears throat> sense pleasure less as a vehicle for happiness. It's learning to value more the qualities of dispassion, the qualities of compassion, the qualities of love, all those qualities of mind which free the mind rather than enslave the mind. And so that's the replacement of delusion by understanding, so that we value what is truly valuable rather than value what is not valuable. And uh, <clears throat> we're talking about something about mindfulness. Mm-hmm. Uh, would you say then that <clears throat> in mindfulness is your response perception unconditioned? Unconditioned in the... Uh, it's important to clarify what we mean by that word because in the Buddhist... Mm, usage, it has a very specific meaning, which often is quite different than how we conventionally use the word. From the Buddhist perspective, mindfulness is conditioned. Everything, everything of this mind-body is conditioned, and only Nibbana is the unconditioned, right? the cessation of this mind-body process. And there is the understanding that in, in observing something mindfully, you see it as it really is. Yes. So in that sense, it's not colored by projections or previous karma. Right. In, in that sense of unconditioned. That's right. Yeah. Unconditioned by previous. Right. You're seeing it as it truly is. Yes. And seeing it free of concept, seeing it free of wrong view. So, for example, there's the old familiar pain in the knee. You know, and, and you're watching it. When we're not mindful, 
we create a whole viewpoint, a whole incorrect viewpoint of my knee hurts and I don't like it. Right? So there's there's the wrong view or the, the concept that there's a knee and a leg and that it belongs to me. And based on that, there's aversion. There's the, the reaction of aversion in the mind. All of that is very different. And I know that you've experienced, you know, at times, the difference between that and experiencing it as a moment of burning, of tightness, of pulling, where all there is is the sensation and the knowing of it. There's no leg, there's no body, there's no self, there's no aversion. There is just seeing it as it actually is. And what we want to do in our practice is to come to that level of understanding moment after moment. And you see how radically different it is from how the world usually perceives things. Which is why we have all for so long, endlessly, been traveling, wandering through this samsara. Because we don't see there's a basic ignorance in our way of understanding which gives rise to all of those links. And that's why the practice, as I say, is, <laughs> although at times, you know, we go through mm, tremendous boredom and restlessness and disgust and impatience and all of that, there is this amazingly profound transformation taking place in every moment of mindfulness because we're seeing truly at that time. It's hard to imagine what would propel one to make any move in the world, having broken the chain of causality. What propels one becomes uh, the skillful states of mind, but which are not taken to be self, to be I. So, for example, after the Buddha's enlightenment, the motive force was the force of compassion. But because there was no ignorance left, all of those actions, it's what's called, they become karmic, karmically functional. The Buddha's actions after his enlightenment was not wholesome karma. It wasn't wholesome, wasn't unwholesome, it was just functional. Meaning there was no result because there was no ignorance behind it. And so just the motivation becomes exceedingly pure at that time. It's just compassion manifesting. No one who owns the compassion doesn't belong to anybody. Compassion and love and and all the skillful factors. And really that's where our practice is leading. So that this becomes a vehicle for that manifestation. Okay, one last question. want to break concepts like me and body and male and female and all of that. Yet, my my understanding of, of is that the Buddha didn't really ignore concepts like male and female and, and had different reactions toward male and female. One of the things I learned from my first teacher, Meninja, was that people would ask him all kinds of questions And basically, he used the questions as an opportunity to say what he wanted. (laughs) Which is what I'm going to do now. (laughs) I did not mean to imply that it's desirable or even possible to eliminate concepts from our lives. It's not. I mean, in order to function on this plane of existence, concepts are absolutely essential. And so it's not to invalidate or undervalue the role of concepts. Rather, it's to discriminate between the concept and the actual experience, so that we're not deluded into taking the one for the other. We use concepts understanding that they're concepts. If we understand the underlying reality, 
then we're not deluded into becoming attached, into craving, into clinging. Yeah, so it, it, it's... An Did you hear my question? <laughs> <laughs> For understanding how the Buddha related to the concept of man or woman, I think you should ask the Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.